gracious Heavenly Father, we're thankful again for the privilege and the opportunity that's ours to worship you. We praise you for thy word. I ask that the Holy Spirit might take what is said and filter it so that only truth remain and that it would be very precious to us. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're studying together the Epistle to the Romans verse by verse, and in our last study together, we were in the area of verses 26 and 27 of chapter 1. I remember when I was a kid at Christmas and how exciting it was to see all of the, the presents, the, the gift wrap, and how devastating that it was to open a present from my mom just to find out it was you know a sweater or socks or or something like that the one redeeming fact was that every once in a while my dad would give me a gift that made sense like like some kind of tool or or like a bb gun and i now read a passage that god wants to tell us something where there isn't any way that we could know it unless god tells us we couldn't dream it or imagine it. And like Christmas, it was kept a secret. There is no way that we could figure it out. So God is going to reveal this awesome news, this wonderful truth that he's kept hidden. That's the word mystery. And here it is. Are you ready for it? Christ in you, the hope of glory. And we read these few words and we, some of us, we sort of feel like we felt maybe when our mom gave us that sweater or those socks. Like unwrapping something that we already had. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And we're like, well, God, is that it? I mean, you said you were going to reveal something really wonderful, really marvelous here. And we read this and we're like, well, didn't we already know that? And as I pointed out, the word mystery, all that the Holy Spirit means when he uses this word is I'm going to tell you something exciting that you don't know, something that you can't know unless I tell you, something that I have purposely hidden from previous periods of time and from previous people and now he's made it manifest. And it's not an incidental bit of information. To know what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And we think, what a letdown. You know, it turns out to be as common as, as a pair of shoes. I see people coming to this verse in one of two ways. Either they expected more or they already knew it, and both of those attitudes are, are attitudes which shield us from the marvel of this mystery, and that's what I want to talk about in this video. I read through Deuteronomy looking at just several of the 613 precepts of the law, and, you know, and I think, wow, I'm, I'm really glad that I'm not there. You know, I'm glad I'm not involved with the strictest chore of sacrifices and law keeping you know from bearing false witness to loving the lord thy god with all thy heart and the staggering impossibility of all of that law drives me into the ground and god comes along and says the hope of glory is not the law the hope of glory is not your performance it's not your obedience it is christ in you it's not your faith in christ it is not you in christ it's christ in you and with a marvelous declaration like that the common attitude appears to be that well that's just that's simply unreasonable and too simple and i see christians who have spent their lives in studying and preaching what they call grace who, if pushed to the wall, don't understand grace. You know, great to be sure, the hope of glory is Christ in you. Plus, 
and then the pluses throw us back into the 613 precepts of the law in Deuteronomy. Circumcision, uh, baptism, you know, and, and when with baptism, that's every way that we can do it just to make sure that we get it right. Face forward, face backwards, upside down, right side up, you know, sprinkling, Sabbath keeping, tithing. We could go on and on and on. You know, oh, I believe a person is saved by grace, but only if we qualify for that grace in some way. And the Holy Spirit says, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And we feel that we have to modify that statement. You know, this, this wonderful revelation that God Almighty willed to make known to us. Christians find it very difficult to simply just accept at face value what this text is saying. Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's almost impossible to comprehend that we live in a period of time when God is not reckoning men's trespasses against them, not imputing men's trespasses unto them. Folks, God is not imputing your trespasses unto you. A few days ago, I, I switched over to a channel on the TV and I heard a man talking about the judgment day and all those things for which we'd give an account, all the evil thoughts, all the all the rotten things that we'd ever done, all the sins we've committed, you know, what we hadn't done and what we should have done, you know, breaking the speed limit, lying, losing our temper. I mean, he just went on and on and on. He had me back in, Deuteron in Deuteronomy chapter 17. There was absolutely no comprehension whatsoever of those words, Christ in you, the hope of glory. What is this hope? It's Christ in you. What could I possibly do more than the Holy Spirit has done to emphasize the majestic statement that God has just made? You know, for a Jew to hear this, you know, it'd be incomprehensible. You know, how do I have any hope of glory? I, I go before a Jewish priest. As a Gentile, I become a Jew, as we read in Esther from this time on, many of the Gentiles became Jews. We, we would call that today convert, converting to Judaism. They went before the priest and they agreed to keep the precepts of the law. And they brought the offerings as, as they were prescribed. And they tithed as they were meant to do. And, and then they picked up stones and they, they threw them at friends and relatives and people that they knew who may have broken some of those precepts of the law, which demanded their death. And now all of a sudden, God says something's changed. Something's been hidden from generations, from ages. Christ became the propitiation for sin Not my sorrow, not my acceptance, not my repentance, not my giving up anything or doing anything, but Christ became the propitiation for my sin. That God is not satisfied from the standpoint of sin because I did something, because I did anything, not because I accepted, not because I believed, not because I received, not because I walked down some aisle and shook some minister's hand, not because I fasted, prayed, went to church, or anything else. God is appeased for my sin because Jesus Christ died in my place. Christ in us, the hope of glory. I want you to note that it's not me in Christ, but Christ in me. The grandest news God could possibly bring, Christ in us, the hope of glory, in the carnal side of my life says, I've got to earn that. You know, if anything's worth having, it's worth working for. And God, surely, surely he's not going to redeem those who don't try as hard as I do. Those who don't obey any better than I obey. At least I'm trying to live for God and do something for God. You know, I'm not like some of those who, who don't want anything to do with God. Therefore, God must in some way recognize my efforts and my, my innate goodness. And I've never stopped to realize that if any of that be true, it's because there is a new heart 
in me that thirsts and, and hungers after God. That's not the old heart, but the new heart. And that the certainty of my relationship with God is Christ in me. That seems so straightforward, so simple, you know, just a simple utterance, one that we should be able to understand and comprehend, and yet Christian after Christian that I meet, people who are not at peace, who are not enjoying their relationship to God, who are carrying some kind of weight, some kind of burden, who say that they're not living good enough or they're not performing well enough. There's not the, the simple comprehension that our relationship is Christ in us, not me in Christ, not anything to do with me, but Christ in me, the hope of glory, and God wants me to know that. He willed that I know that. You know, but you couldn't possibly comprehend that this could be true of a Gentile. Peter came back and bore witness that the Holy Spirit falls on Gentiles like it does Jews. You know, we read from before that certain came from James. He did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. We read that in Galatians chapter 2, so that Paul had to withstand him to the face because he was wrong. Why was he wrong? Peter had mixed with Christ in you the hope of glory, the remnants of the law. Christians today are, are, are they're not mixing Old Testament sacrifices and, and offerings. You, you, I doubt very seriously you'll see your neighbor go out and, and sacrifice a lamb in his backyard. But... They do view the New Testament as a substitution for Old Testament law. They, they read instructions in the New Testament, and, and not now, now we're back in, in Deuteronomy. It doesn't matter that it's the New Testament. Uh, I pointed out before that the instruction in the New Testament is a, is a picture. It's a portrait of our Savior, folks. Christ in us, the hope of glory that should follow naturally, that springs forth from the truth of Christ in you, the certainty of glory. I knew of a church once that, that actually banned whistling, and I kind of like whistling. You know, and churches, they'll say, well, we can have a piano, but not an organ. You know, that's just a little too worldly. It's anathema to mention certain things which may be of enjoyment to you. I got in a lot of trouble uh, by mentioning bowling one time, and, and I'm not even that good a bowler. Why is it that we are unwilling to use grace as God uses grace? Listen, God wants to tell you something. He willed that you know that you as a Gentile are not weighted down by the law. You're not hindered or fettered by human performance, that the hope of glory is Christ in you. And folks, I praise God that the text here does not say you in Christ. That it doesn't say your acceptance of Christ, your belief in Christ, your repentance, your tithing, or anything else, but Christ in you. Those of you who have followed us here on this channel, we found out in Ephesians and Romans how that we receive the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll soon, actually, we'll soon see in chapter 2 here of Colossians, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. In the same way that you received him, you walk in him. And, and many Christians today, they believe that they receive the Lord Jesus Christ as a result of their own efforts, their own will, their own logic, their own planning, their own ability, their own will. And they apply the same thing to their walk. But chapter 2 presupposes that we understand these verses here in chapter 1. 
You know, many a sermon's been preached on the 28th verse. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ. And so now we start warning you about the dangers of alcohol and cigarettes and speeding. And, and I mean, we could go on and on and on about the fact that, that you haven't been water baptized in the right way. And, and you know, basically what that means is we, we what the text is saying, Steve, is it's saying that we must warn every man about the way he lives. And folks, if that's the attitude that you get on the 28th verse, You've picked one verse out of two whole chapters that have nothing to do with that subject. For me to read into that verse that, that I ought to be warning you about the way that you live, the way that you, you, you do things, anything, the way you go to church, the way you worship, the way you serve God, the way you believe, except, you know, whether or not you've done everything that you ought to do so that you'll be the best Christian you know how to be. To take that verse and say that's what it means is to totally isolate it from the context. And folks, I don't I don't think you have a right to do that. Should I warn you because I think that the way that you ought to live your life is 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 the way that I live mine. You know, I love my neighbor the right way, so you know, well, as long as you don't talk to my neighbor. And I'm pretty well convinced that I love my neighbor fairly well, like it ought to be done. And so I'll tell you how you ought to do it. And so when I begin to warn you, it, it'll be it'll be warnings, you know, to you in areas of of your life, uh, like your marriage, your kids, your job, and I mean, it'll never end. I I'll just I'll warn you how the judgment of God of God will come upon you if you don't do what. What, what I do, or if you don't do what I believe is right, and you don't serve, and you're not faithful, but folks, that verse won't fit the context in which it's found. Dearly beloved, God wants you to know what the hope, he wants you to know that the hope of glory is not your law keeping, it is not how you live, but it is Christ in you, and it is Christ that we preach. Look at the text. We preach Christ, not ourselves. We preach Christ, not how you ought to live, but it's Christ that we preach. Warning you, admonishing would be a better word, admonishing you not to be under the law, not to be involved in those things whereby you believe that you are gaining merit with God. If you're serving the Lord Jesus Christ and if you're doing it properly, it's because of Christ in you. If you've engineered it, if you've designed it, it may be far from any concept of, of Christ in you. If we could just simply learn to rest in the Lord. He knows tomorrow. The Lord Jesus Christ, he said, take no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's his righteousness, not your own. And all these things shall be added unto you. That's Jesus Christ, not your service for Christ, not your faith in Christ, not your acceptance of Christ, but Christ. And all of these other things will be added unto you. Matthew 6. Yet I'm persuaded that most of us as Christians are much more concerned about all the other things first. Listen, folks, you are not earning favor with God. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Please stop for a moment and consider the, the fact that you have been made the righteousness of God in Christ. That is how you walk. That's where, you, that's where our relationship with God begins. You couldn't become any more righteous than what you already are. So what are you striving for? What are you trying to achieve? You're not earning favor with God. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. The certainty of the fact that Christ is in you is the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the admonition is not for you to earn that, not for you to, to 
deserve it, not for you to seek it, but simply to welcome it as truth. Just as you welcome the Lord Jesus Christ as a gift, so you welcome your walk as a gift. No, oh, but I, I don't want my walk. I want I want this I want this other guy's walk. His walk's a whole lot easier than my walk. The Lord was talking with Peter about what God was going to do in Peter's life, and Peter's first comment was, What about John? None of your business, the Lord said. You know, it's an easy thing to make other Christians' lives our business. When there's, there is no other Christian who stands or falls, except God makes him stand. It, it, is, it is Christ whom we constantly proclaim. It's a, it's a present tense. We constantly preach Christ and we admonish you and we teach you. All of these are present tenses. That's the constant activity of the work of the Holy Spirit, that we may present every man complete in Christ. I strive, I labor to present you complete in Christ. Not that you would have to do anything or that you need to do anything or you must do something to become complete in Christ, but that you would realize that you have, are you stand before God holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. That you rest in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory. I don't want to ride a hobby horse, folks, but the greatest infiltration into your life for Christ is human work and human merit. It's what's preached. It's what's eagerly received. It's what, in fact, people want to hear. If I preached that, I'd get, I don't know how many, uh, thousands and thousands of views probably on every video. That's what people want to hear, that they had some part in it. And the warning of this verse, I am telling you folks, the warning of this verse is not your manner of service in life for Christ, but it, it is a theological warning concerning the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why is there such an emphasis on Christian responsibility? And you know, if you follow this channel, you know where I stand on Christian responsibility. But you also know that we put the cart before the horse. Christian performance, when, when that is the result, not the cause of spiritual growth in Christ, in you, the hope of glory. I mean, those are things, folks, that should come naturally. It springs forth naturally. We, we should not be driven by the result. The result should come naturally because of the cause, which is Christ in us, the hope of glory. We've already looked at Christ's sufferings. You know, fill up that which is behind and of the afflictions of Christ. That's a simple genitive. They are Christ's afflictions, folks. They're not yours. If, I, if I'm preaching to you about the, the afflictions of Christ that occurred so that you could stand before God holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight, that's what I'm talking about. They're not your afflictions, they're His. We proclaim, first of all, the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we admonish, we admonish from law-keeping as a rule of life, from law-keeping, from human merit, from human performance, in order to gain position and merit with God. And we teach the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ that His people might be presented complete in Him. That is what the text is saying. If you don't understand this, then you're going to approach this text and read it from the standpoint of being back in Deuteronomy. Well, we've got to present every man complete in Christ, and that means we've got to get them busy doing the right things and stop doing the wrong things. 
That's not what the text is saying. I'm not suggesting, folks, there's no responsibility. What I'm suggesting is that the service and the responsibility that is spiritual grows out of the truth of Christ in you, the hope of glory, not, not in any way from some logical deduction that I need to do these things, do certain things in order to please God, to earn merit with God, to ensure glory. What I'm pleading for it is a service and a sense of responsibility that comes as a result of that relationship. Not in any way to try to initiate or, pre or preserve that relationship. The verse starts out, to whom God wills to make known. Therefore, this must be supremely important to God, folks. It's, it was kept as a mystery for ages and generations. It is the will of God that we know this. And I don't want to pass by and go on into, go finish out the, the rest of the first chapter and go into the second chapter without you seeing this. It's a beautiful passage of comfort. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Look, I love you all. I truly do. I pray for you all constantly. I ask you to keep me uh, continue to keep me in your prayers. I want to thank you for all of your your comments. Uh, your comments that I read on these videos, they they also keep me encouraged. Keep looking up as well. I believe that we are going home soon. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.